All right, it's 5.05, so I think we can get started. My name is Christine Burns. I'm from Anacostia Riverkeeper, and um, we also have Trey, our Riverkeeper, on the line. And we're really excited today to um, open up the floor to a group of GW students who reached out to us, I want to say in December of last year, um, hoping to do a project that was relevant to the Anacostia River. and um, we kind of thought about it a little bit at um, our end and realized that some something we really needed some more information on was um, different types of plastic bottle policies and legislation that would um, that we could maybe build a plastic bottle campaign around uh, for the Anacostia. And so um, through a little bit of discussion with these guys, we uh, kind of scoped out a project and they've been working on it really diligently for the past uh, four or five months and um, are going to present the results of their analysis to everyone today. So um, without further ado, I want to turn it over to um, Liliana Siegelman, Tyler Phillips, Nicole Eckerman, Grace Gonzalez, and Laura, Lauren Calhoun uh, from the GW um, M master's program in environmental resource policy. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are LLTNG Consulting. As Christine mentioned, my name is Grace. This is Lauren, Liliana, Nicole, and Tyler. We're here to present our policy analysis for plastic bottle reduction in the Anacostia River in DC. Our project is conducted for our client, the Anacostia Riverkeepers, in conjunction with George Washington's Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration as culminating project for our Masters in Environmental Resource Policy program. The representatives we worked with include Christine and Trey, both of which helped guide us through the project. Grace, before we go on, Christine, were you able to start recording? Yep, got it, thanks. Okay. We're first going to dive into our problem statement, followed by our methodology, objectives, and research questions. We then will present our five final policy alternatives, along with our four chosen criteria, and then go into discussing our case studies. Then we'll look at the analytical hierarchy process model and our criteria alternative matrix to conclude with our recommendations, significant findings, and challenges. So as was said, the Anacostia River Keepers um, asked us to look into policy options in DC that would help reduce plastic beverage containers in the Anacostia River. We decided the best way to do this was to create a policy analysis to look at different policy alternatives. To aid in our research, we came up with the following problem statement. In Washington, DC, a large portion of waste entering the Anacostia River are plastic beverage bottles, which are causing damage to the environment, the health of residents, and environmental injustices in areas near the river. So to create our policy alternatives, as well as criteria, we decided to begin looking at the scope and extent of the problem. So the Anacostia is one of the only rivers in the country that is designated as impaired by trash under the Clean Water Act, and 60% by weight of that trash are plastic beverage bottles. So when a body is considered impaired under the Clean Water Act, um, the state is required to um, create a total maximum daily load for that water. And um, this just means that there's a limit on the amount of pollutants that are, that are allowed in that water. So in 2010, in conjunction with Maryland, the DC Department of Energy and the Environment created a TMDL for trash. The map that you see on the screen, um, the blue dots represent areas. They are trash hotspots that were found in the TMDL and the research done for the TMDL. The orange, hot, orange dots are hotspots specifically for plastic beverage um, containers and that were found by the Anacostia River Keepers. And the purple X up at the top is a hotspot that was found both for trash as well as plastic beverage containers. So as you can see from this map, all of these hotspots are concentrated in wards seven and eight. 
And the graph that just came up on the screen is a breakdown of race by ward in DC. So if you look at the very top, you can see wards seven and eight. And as you can see, those have the highest non-white population out of all of the DC wards. As well, they have the lowest income out of all the wards in DC. So we presume that the trash problem in DC is directly related to income as well as race in DC. So after looking at the location of the trash, we examined the health impacts of plastic. Um, so clean nature has many health benefits, mental health benefits, and has been shown to increase test scores in students, reduce violence, as well as decrease crime. However, a lot of that can be diminished when the area, when the when nature is impaired by trash. So you see that mostly in wards seven and eight. Additionally, there are a lot of physical health impacts from plastic. Those mostly are from microplastics in the water. So microplastics are just microscopic pieces of plastic and plastic breaks down. So it becomes these tiny, tiny pieces. And microplastics contain chemicals that are known endocrine disruptors. So when it's ingested by organisms or humans, it can cause issues such as cancer as well as reproductive problems. Also, microplastics contain heavy metals. So when those, those can cause water quality issues, um, as well as when ingested, it causes similar problems to those endocrine disrupting chemicals. In the past, DC has created a few attempts to control uh, the plastic pollution in the river. The first being in 1974, DC Try, attempted to pass a bottle bill and a ban on pull tabs. A bottle bill will be, what it is will be discussed further in this presentation. Um, however, it is essentially just a bottle return program. However, it did pass the council, but the mayor vetoed that bill. Um, the next attempt was in 1986, DC attempted to pass the District of Columbia Beverage Container Acceptance and Refund Act. So this um, was essentially the same exact bill as the 1974 bill. However, it never passed uh, DC Council as there was a lot of pushback from the industry and they gained a lot of support from DC community against this bill. And so it, had, it was very unpopular among the public and never got very far. The last is the DC Zero Waste Initiative of 2014. So that initiative has the goal of diverting 80% of waste from landfills by 2032. The funnel on the side shows a hierarchy of preferred waste management strategy, strategies under the initiative. This has been somewhat successful in 2020, waste diversion from landfills um, increased by 25%. However, there's still a lot more to be done. All right, so next we'll go over the methodology section. So we broke this project into four main stages. The first stage being our background stage, where we established the needs of Anacostia River Keepers and began developing our research questions. And using those research questions, we started doing background searches on some information and also did some educational interviews with several industry experts just to get a better handle on the problem. Next, using the information we found, we developed our five policy options and our four uh, criteria. Our second stage would be our research stage where we started looking into our case studies and our of our bottle bills and also looking into proxies for some of our policies as they haven't been implemented very extensively. We also did semi structured interviews for industry and policy experts for each different policy option. And we also did bottle audits with the Anacostia River Keepers to get a better understanding of the pl pl plastic problem localized to DC. Third is our analysis where we weighted our criteria using an analytical hierarchy process, which we'll go into in a little bit later. We also scored each of the policies against the criteria, which we used to fill out our criteria alternatives matrix to get a final total count or a total weight for each of our policies. Last, we did a policy trade off to give a pro con list of each of the policies. And last, we did a final recommendation for Anacostia Rupert Keepers. So our research questions and objectives, we started pretty broad, like just in a general scope within the United States and kind of narrowed them down as we went, but they are as follows. What are current policies to, de 
to decrease plastic bottle waste in watersheds across the US? What policies would be effective in DC? What would be the cost of private stakeholders for plastic beverage container reduction policies in DC? How would low income communities be impacted by the alternatives? And what is the administrative feasibility of policy alternatives for plastic beverage container reduction for the DC government? So to begin the case studies, we began with um, a look at for our plastic bottle tax. So the first, we used two different taxes for this case study, a sugar sweetened beverage tax and the DC bag law. A sugar sweetened beverage tax is an excise tax on all any distributor that distributes sugar sweetened beverages within a city. Eight cities currently have sugar sweetened beverage taxes in place and those they range from one to two cents per ounce. So the tax revenue is supposed to go back in, into the community to help to help with health impacts from sugar sweetened beverages. The DC bag law, I'm sure most of us are very familiar with, is a five cent tax at the point of sale for any plastic or paper bag. So there were some key takeaways from these from this case study. The first is that Plastic bottles are expected to have an elastic demand. So therefore, when the price goes up, we expect demand to go down, meaning that less bottles are sold in DC. And that means less bottles ending up in the Anacostia River. The second is that some cities have advisory boards that administer the tax revenue from sugar sweetened beverages. However, those have been found to be somewhat burdensome to the agency that's administering the tax. Also, the agency generally has a better idea of the stakeholders involved as well as the problem. So this would not be beneficial for the DC area. Finally, the piece of legislation needs to strictly define how the tax, tax revenue can be used within the city. Otherwise, you can lose a lot of public support for the tax. All right, so before we go into our bottle bill case study, we wanted to explain what a bottle bill is, because unless you've lived in a bottle bill state or just really involved with recycling, you probably don't know what a bottle bill is. So currently there are 10 states with bottle bills. And as this graphic below kind of demonstrates, basically when a consumer goes to the grocery store and wants to buy a bottle of water, they have to pay a five or 10 cent deposit, depending on the state additional to the price of the bottle. So after the consumer is done with the beverage, they can then bring the beverage back to either a redemption center or a reverse vending machine known as RBMs or a bottle drop location where they are given the five, 10 cent deposit back. So then after they've been given their deposit, then corporations like beverage industries are then required to transport and recycle said bottles. So within our case study, we specifically looked at only six of the 10 bottle bill states. We looked at California, Michigan, Maine, Massachusetts, Oregon, and Vermont. We excluded Hawaii, New York, and Connecticut simply because they didn't have any defining features that weren't already addressed in the six states we were studying. And we excluded Iowa because they're currently dismantling their bottle bill and the redemption rates are not really accurate right now. So our key takeaways from this case study is that bottle bills really need to be written to update automatically. A lot of people we interviewed discussed how difficult it could be to update antiquated bottle bills um, as it's difficult to get through state legislature to update that. Also, we wanted to include standardized reporting requirements as a lot of states have different ways they report and how they do that. So we wanted to make sure it was very transparent for the public to understand how this bottle bill works. Also, providing easy access is key to any bottle bill. Um, states like Massachusetts are having a lot of difficulty with bottle redemption numbers because people can't access redemption centers easily. So to make sure if DC were to implement this policy, we wanna make sure that those redemption centers are re and reverse bidding machines are very easily accessible. Also, we wanna create a fraud prevention system. Uh, small states, especially like DC that have a, a large commuter population may have issues with people buying a bottle in Virginia or Maryland and then trying to redeem that bottle in DC. And this would take money away from the program and people who honestly bought the bottle in DC. So we wanna make sure we have a system to prevent that. We also wanna allow different stakeholder groups to be involved in creating this bottle bill in the past groups like curbside recyclers and retailers have been really against bottle bills simply because they haven't been involved in the process and they're 
you know, take on things has been ignored. So we want to make sure they're included in this. Now I'm going to go into our case study for our plastic bottle ban alternative. In absence of a statewide bottle ban, we chose DC's foam ban as a proxy for our analysis of the bottle ban. The Sustainable DC Omnibus Act of 2014 includes amendments from 2016 and 2019, which ban the use and retail sale of styrofoam products. The key takeaways include specifying which products are included in the ban and which aren't, in addition to specifying which business outlets are required to abide by the bill. Setting dates for implementation and enforcement phases have also helped in overall success and compliance of the program. Addressing affordability and accessibility of alternatives is also important for assessing the policy's impact on lower income groups. Finally, the most important aspect of the bottle ban alternative would be its potential to effectively reduce plastic bottles in the river over a short period of time. So with uh, our research question and our problem state of mind, uh, as well as our case studies that we uh, conducted, uh, we came up with the five policy alternatives, as we mentioned, which are the bottle bill tax, the bottle ban, the bottle bill itself, shelf space percentage, and then status quo. Those were our five policy alternatives. The first of which is our bottle tax. This policy option uh, would be a five cent in excess tax that would be put on distributors for each bottle, plastic bottle that they distribute in DC. Uh, this revenue would be deposited into the new, a new fund named the Anacostia River Plastic Bottle Reduction Fund. Funds will be administered by the Office of the Department of Environment or the uh, DOEE. Uh, funds from this tax uh, can and only will be used for the purpose of cleaning and protecting the Anacostia River or ensuring DC residents have access to clean drinking water and reusable bottles. Uh, funds are allowed for um, these, are, are, um, there's different um, specific, specified programs for this or options. Uh, the next one is the bottle bill. Uh, this one is a program uh, run by beverage corporations. This is kind of modeled off of the organ system this would be a 15 cent deposit, as Lauren mentioned before, that would be uh, paid up front, and then each bottle returned uh, would be eligible for a 15 cent uh, refund. This can be done by reverse spending machines, redemption centers, or bottle drops. Underdeemed funds will be split between uh, retailers and the uh, aforementioned Anacostia River uh, Plastic Bottle Reduction Fund. Um, the next one would be the bottle ban. This would be a, after three years, would be implemented uh, by the DC government. Uh, the first year would be an implementation phase. Uh, the second would be uh, checking for, um, checking businesses for uh, implementation, warnings for non-compliance. Um, and then the third would be a full uh, ban in effect and uh, range of fines would range from 100 to $800. The mayor would also be required to provide a list of vendors with uh, uh, different alternatives that they could use on um, their shelves. Uh, the next of the uh, policy alternatives is the policy, the shelf space percentage policy alternative. Uh, this was an original policy that we came up with. Uh, it's never been tried before. Uh, this is a very unique policy in the sense that uh, in this policy, the uh, there would be a, a mandate for a certain number of percentage of uh, plastic alternatives on the shelf. As you can see from the graph, after for the first two years, there will be no mandate. It will be a zero percent uh, uh, requirement, and then that allow for implementation. And then each year after, it'll be a ten percent increase, uh, capping off at seventy five percent. The timeline and model was uh, modeled after Florida and California. Uh, based on their styrofoam ban. Um, the next policy option would be the status quo. Um, as you know, this would be no policy option, uh, action, excuse me. And we believe that uh, plastic bottle pollution would be expected to remain the same or increase. Yeah. 
Now I'm going to go over our chosen criteria, which we weigh against our policy options to calculate the optimal policy for DC. Our first criterion is environmental equity, which measures each policy's level of equity across different income groups. And this is based on the reduction of plastic bottles at trash hotspots along the river, monthly budget expenditures on water, and the presence of lead pipes in residential buildings. Our second criterion measures the efficacy of each policy option, and it is assessed through the number through the reduction in number of plastic bottles found in the Anacostia during river cleanups and bottle audits. Our third criterion is administrative feasibility, and this measures the likelihood that DC's local government and departments can effectively implement the policy alternative. The policies are measured specifically on complexity and time needed to implement. Finally, our cost criterion measures each policy's options cost in dollars to relevant stakeholders. Relevant stakeholders include plastic bottle manufacturers, bottle distributors, retailers, waste haulers, and recyclers. Any cost increases would come in the form of a tax or any additional costs to switch to alternative products. All right, next. You might have heard us mention the AHP or analytical hierarchy process model. We assume most of you probably, unless you're a policy or model long, don't know what an AHP is. So we're going to walk you through how to do that. But basically the reason why we decided to use the AHP model was to eliminate our personal bias and how we develop the weights for the criteria and also to better meet, meet our clients needs by giving Anacostia a stake and like a say of like what the weights would be. So to start, we gave Anacostia a survey asking them to rate each of the criteria against each other. So asking them to rate efficacy against administrative feasibility. And as you can see by the chart in the red, the purplish red, that they rated efficacy five times more important than administrative feasibility. So after I got all the answers for each of the ranks, we then sum down to get the score at the bottom. After doing that, you take each of the ranks and divide it by the sum in the column and put it into a new chart, which you then average across to get the score. So the scores are respectively as follows. Efficacy is 40%, administrative feasibility is 9%, environmental equity is 47%, and cost to private stakeholders would be 4%. So after getting our criteria weights, we then wanted to score each of the policies for the CAM matrix. So we first started by projecting the outcomes of each policy. And essentially we decided how well the criteria the policy did in each criteria category. So, and we'll go over that a little bit later too. So we scored each policy on a scale of one to 10, one meaning that policy was terrible at meeting the criteria and 10 meaning that policy perfectly met the criterion. We then put in the weights based off of the AHP model and put all the scores and ranks into the CAM matrix, which I'll show you on the next slide, but essentially it's just a multiplication chart where you multiply each of the numbers in the row by the weight and then sum down the columns after multiplying each of the rows to get your final policy score. As mentioned previously, our policy criteria all pol our policy alternatives were ranked by weight and how they scored in the different criteria boxes so with our bottle tax we noted that environmental equity had a high score of seven since it did not significantly affect the price of plastic beverage containers and the tax revenue would go to help manage other problems it also scored high in administration and equity, or sorry, it also scored high in efficiency as the sale of plastic beverage containers is fairly elastic and is expected to decrease between 20 and 60%. Next, it scored very high in administrative feasibility as this tax has been implemented in multiple cities and the DOEE has a similar process in place for implementing tax as well as the personnel to help manage it. It also scored fairly high in cost to private stakeholders as the tax would mostly be passed down to consumers. Our bottle bill scored highest in environmental equity overall uh, between all the policy alternatives 
since every race and income group will have a fair shot at redeeming plastic bottles at redemption centers, bottle drops, or reverse vending machines. It also scored very high in efficiency since we predict a large decrease in the number of plastic bottles entering the Anacostia River since they will be collected at those redemption sites and consumers are incentivized to bring the bottles back through the deposit. Next, it also scored very high in administrative feasibility. Although it has a high complexity, bottle bills have been successfully implemented in other states. Therefore, we predict it will be easy to implement a bottle bill in DC since it has those previous models to um, examine. The trade-off for this is it has a high cost to private stakeholders with its upfront costs of developing and installing those reverse vending machines and redemption centers. For the bottle ban, we saw that it had a high efficiency score, the highest efficiency score of nine, since it would stop the most amount of plastic beverage containers from entering the, the Anacostia River at the smallest amount of time. However, beverage containers also come in from border states such as Maryland and Virginia, preventing it from receiving a perfect score. Administrative feasibility would also um, score fairly high uh, since implementation of the DC Sustainable Omnibus Act has also been set in motion. However, it scores very low on cost to private stakeholders as beverage corporations we assume will bear the cost to switching to alternative beverage containers and this in turn might increase grocery prices for uh, containers of beverages and therefore negatively impact lower income communities lastly we examined the shelf space percentage which scored fairly average throughout all the criteria. Um, environmental equity scored a five since water bottles, we wrote into the bill water bottles would be available during states of emergency since that is important to ensure equitable access to water during those times. Efficiency scores a six since it would reduce the sale of plastic beverage bottles by 75% which we assume will decrease the amount of bottles entering the Anacostia by around 75% from DC's share. Um, however, this is not a perfect elimination of bottles, so it scores average on the efficiency rate. Uh, administrative feasibility, however, scores of three. It's very low since this policy has not been implemented in any other location. So DC would need to hire new personnel to manage the program as well as um, we aren't sure that this policy will be um, workable administratively since it's never been implemented before. Lastly, it would have a high cost for beverage corporations as well since they will be transitioning to those alternative materials. The status quo we predict will have low and continue to have low um, outcomes for environmental equity, as well as, um, Lauren, can you go down? As low, well as efficiency, since consumers would have to still see plastic bottles entering those low income areas and um, throughout the Anacostia, administrative feasibility and cost to stakeholders would be fairly high since there would be no change. So for our recommendation, we would recommend that DC try to pass a bottle bill again. We believe it would optimize all four criteria. The limitations of this policy might include resistance from the beverage industry and lobbying groups, as well as limited space for retailers to implement the bill. However, we address these for these concerns within our policy and we recommend periodic and automatic updates for the bottle bill, standardized reporting requirements, increased accessibility to RVMs and redemption centers, especially in retailers with 
smaller space, we account for that concern of space by saying we only would recommend one vending machine in smaller stores and more in larger grocery stores. And we also recommend a bottle identification system to minimize that potential of fraud. But overall, we think that the bottle bill would result in the greatest amount of bottles being removed from the Anacostia River, as well as less harmful chemicals being released into the water from the breakdown of those bottles into um, plastics, and it will improve the conditions of residents in marginalized communities. We would like to thank Trey Sherard and Christine Burns again for working with us on this project. We would also like to thank JT Calhoun, Tom Falona, Dr. Peter Linquiti of the George Washington University, and everyone we interviewed for this project for their guidance and support. All right, questions. And we can take any questions. Thank you guys. Um, I will allow people to drop your questions in the chat, or um, if you wanna say your question out loud, you can put your name in the chat and I should be able to give you the power to unmute yourself. And while we're waiting for people to get warmed up, maybe I'll just start off with a question. Um, since the bottle bill is the one that you recommended, I'm wondering if you have any advice from sort of lessons learned from the bottle bills of 1974 and 86, I believe it was, um, so that it is more politically feasible or, or more achievable this time around. Liana, do you want to talk about that one? Or I can go for it. I'll right, go for that one. Yeah. So we, one of the people we interviewed is Tommy Wells, who is part of the DOEE. And we talked with him about previous DC attempts. And he said in the past that there was just like a lot of lobbying efforts from beverage corporations and like involved stakeholders. And he said now that the political landscape is kind of changing in DC, that even if they were to have a lot of that lobbying, it wouldn't necessarily impact, like if DC were to Im implement a bottle bill. And also we, one of the people we interviewed from Vermont, part of their environmental department suggested that a lot of beverage corporations are kind of warming up to the idea of a bottle bill simply because it's either a bottle bill or it's eventually going to be banned. So their tone is kind of changing around that. So we think we think that would have a big impact on how successfully like we could pass a bottle bill. Well, I think that also sort of addresses Anne's question, which is the what is the best way to counter opposition from the bottle lobby? Do you have anything more specific you want to address on that? Or do you feel like you're less concerned about it this time simply because there is a little bit more openness to it. Yeah, we're definitely a little bit less concerned about it this time. Third time's the charm. <laughs> Third time's the charm, let's hope. Um, Ken says, I imagine microplastics are not a significant problem in the Anacostia, more of an ocean issue. Um, I don't think that the GW students went into this too much, but we have done a few studies um, of microplastics in the Anacostia, and we certainly have them um, because we have plenty of trash in our waterways. There's plenty of opportunity for it to break down into microplastics, and um, we can direct you to some of our resources on that afterwards, Ken. Um, I think Susan would like you to speak more about the bottle ID system that you envision to help prevent bottles from sort of crossing borders and how that would be sort of implemented on a standard bottle. Yeah, so I can speak on that one a little bit, Lauren. Um, so one of the things we came across when we were interviewing policy experts from different states is a barcode ID system. So basically a barcode or a specific symbol is printed on the bottle itself. And that way, when you bring it over to a redemption center, you can scan the barcode into a reverse vending machine or the people collecting it can scan that barcode and know that it's from the DC area rather than other states. 
Yeah. And currently a lot, none of the states have like a, a fraud prevention on the bottle. Like they have fraud prevention departments where if they see somebody like redeeming tons and tons of bottles, like on a weekly basis, they might look into it, but there's no point at which they try to stop fraud prevention, like with the bottle. So that's what we're aiming to do simply because the DC just has such a large commuting population and, you know, people from Maryland and Virginia come in every day. So it would be really difficult and really expensive to have a, a fraud prevention department, like within the DC government. So we just wanted to stop it at its source. There's also in a couple of different bottle bill states, a requirement for people bringing in large amounts of bottles at a time to present their either license number or um, address or something like that to prove that they're from the area. That makes a lot of sense. Um, something that I think somebody asked in here was about, uh, I think how you spoke to DOEE and, and to Tommy. And one of the questions that I had been thinking about earlier was when you were coming up with your political or your administrative feasibility, did you present any of these options to Tommy to help you rate them? Or are these mostly sort of your projections of political feasibility? Um, I can talk about that. So um, I think something that's important to note is that we actually looked at administrative feasibility versus political feasibility. So um, when we talked to Tommy Wells, as well as like Lauren said, um, the person from Vermont, we found that we felt that political feasibility wasn't as important as administrative feasibility at the moment. So whether or not the um, agency could actually administer the program. So we left political feasibility out of this analysis, um, if that's helpful. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think so. I think a couple of people have asked a similar question to just um, even when you were coming up with your efficacy numbers and your administrative fe feasibility numbers and things like that. Um, were these sort of you guys coming together and, and thinking about the data in a certain way or, or how did you get like the administrative feasibility of one is a five? So how we did it was we actually all ranked them ourselves. So we all learned a lot about the different policies and we all ranked them ourselves and then came together and had an extensive discussion about how we wanted to score them. So it's based off of a lot, a lot of time researching these policies as well as discussion among each other. And also they are just projected outcomes. There are best assumption of how the policy will impact the area like once it's been implemented. So we can't so with like 100% certainty, like any of this would happen, but it's just like from our knowledge and from our research, this is like how we think it would affect the criteria. I'm not seeing any new questions, but a lot of can at, at the same time. So if I missed your question, feel free to, to chime in or throw it back in the bottom. A number of people are talking about, um, just uh, the Container Recycling Institute and some other resources that we could lean on for developing any kind of bottle. Yeah, we used we used a lot of them for the, for the research paper. <laughs> we cited them a lot. Um, here's a question: Is there a correlation on waste education and areas impacted? Um, so, would there be an element of education included in any kind of bottle bill? So, so the bottle tax, as well as the bottle bill. They both have the tax revenue going into, I'm not sure about the correlation that's kind of outside the scope of our research, but um, both of them have the money going into that fund that we discussed. And one of the allowable usage um, within that fund is for environmental education programs. Tyler, were you gonna say something too? I was gonna say the same thing Liliana said. Okay, great. Um, Christine, I just got oh. home, so I wanted to hop on. This is Trey. Yeah, again. please do. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Trey with Riverkeeper. Um, a, I got home and I just saw Trey on White, Councilmember White, out front of my house canvassing, and I told him what an important issue 
bottles was, and he seems happy to pick it up. So it's just fun timing to, to bump into a council member and ask for some follow-up. So I encourage everybody else, while everyone's canvassing this year, it is a campaign year. So we want to start lighting fires. And the thing that we keep hearing about political will is that not enough individuals are asking their electeds what they are doing about this problem. Everybody kind of sees the problem. Not many people don't know that it's a problem. Um, as soon as anybody gets on the boat or on the river, you know, it's, it's easy to see that it's a problem. But the electeds don't feel any pressure to solve this problem uh, because they don't feel enough political will is behind it. Uh, so that's, that's just something I wanted to mention. My actual question for the, the GW crew, um, how did y'all, did y'all have a means of quantifying or at least tiering efficacy and cost to private stakeholders impacts? You, you know, you kept talking about the, the shift from plastic bottles to other materials. Um, most, and I don't know if this is true, so if you had any of the, the stakeholder research to, to go into this, I would appreciate it. In my mind, most distributors of plastic bottles have parallel production and distribution chains already in aluminum and glass. And I'm, I'm not persuaded that many of the big players would really have that much retooling to do, or at least not difficult retooling since they already have these things in their capacity. You know, a lot of these brands produce aluminum and glass already for stores, uh, like some of the small shops in DC that specifically seek out non-plastic materials already. Uh, so I'd, I'd be curious to know how that came out. And then with regards to the drinking water, emergency water things, you know, we've seen canned or uh, boxed water. Right now, Mandarin Oriental Hotel, every single complimentary water that they give to their guests in all of their rooms is actually canned. Um, so we're, we're seeing these things happen on small to larger scales already in emergency and other complimentary water situations. So I'd, I'd be curious to know how much of that y'all were able to chase down and, and how that would or would not sway efficacy and, and other criteria. Okay, um, I can take it. What was the first part of the question again, Trey? I'm sorry. So question one was, you know, a lot of the big distributors of and manufacturers of these products, they already have parallel um, product threads in, in aluminum and in glass, right? So that's, mm -hmm. how did y'all assess that? Or, or did you just kind of assume there would be sort of standard retooling costs, even, even for those that already have, have their business in can and glass elsewhere? Yeah. So we didn't have any, we unfortunately didn't have any like hard numbers with costs associated, but we just kind of like assumed like, okay, well, yeah, there's like, there might be some retooling or switching to alternatives might be more expensive to switch. Like if they were to, I don't know, say completely switch over to glass bottles, like those are very heavy and they're much larger than plastic and aluminum bottles. So transportation costs would increase a lot compared to plastic. We also took into consideration like how, like, especially with the bottle bill, like the producers are completely responsible for running that kind of program. Like they're responsible for setting up the reverse vending machines, uh, the transportation to and from the redemption centers, like recycling those, like making sure it gets to a recycling center. So that th we included something like that in our cost. Or like with the tax, we assumed like they might start like in the first year of the tax, like taking on that tax, but then they would eventually pass that tax down to the consumer. So they would no longer be paying that tax, but the consumer would. And what was the second part of the question? Oh, that's that's a great answer to the first part. So thank you. Um, the second part of the question was with regards to like emergency access to water and and water in particular. Did y'all kind of dig into the fact that there are already alternatives to plastic bottled water on the market and in in use in emergency situations? So things like boxed water, and then uh, we have a partner in Mandarin Oriental Hotel. And they already all of their waters they give now to their guests are in cans. And then they actually recoup that money back from a metal recycler on the backside. We didn't dig too far. Oh, sorry, who wanted to take that? I, I was just gonna, gonna say, speak that. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that I think in, in terms of, yeah, we didn't think too far into it. I think it was more of a sense of having uh, as easy access to any type of water 
uh, necessary during an emergency. Uh, we're reducing those barriers um, for that particular time frame. Um, I don't know if Lauren or Nicole want to add on to that. Particularly with the bottle ban, that's one of the reasons that we've seen um, resistance to a bottle ban is because during emergency times, such as an earthquake or a hurricane, you want to get the most amount of water to the place as fast as possible. So um, some of the cities have shown opposition to uh, ban because of that reason. So it's mostly about distributing that water, as Tyler mentioned, as fast as possible. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like in one of our earlier discussions about this, you also talked about potentially putting some sort of size clause onto any ban or, or something like that, that would help sort of limit the what size containers that we were potentially talking about banning. So that could also help alleviate, um, you know, the emergency issues. Yeah, because one of the things with the ban is that I don't know how aware people are of this in DC, but DC has a lot of lead pipes. And while DC like municipalities will replace lead pipes among the city, they won't replace them once they cross into like the residential buildings. So people in low income areas who can't afford to replace their lead pipes have problems accessing like clean, safe drinking water. So we put the limit on or the ban on bottled water or plastic bottles under 17 ounces. So then people could still buy gallons of water, but the gallons of water aren't what we were seeing in the bottle audits. We're seeing like the single like portable bottles. So we were hoping that we would reduce those bottles in the river and we might consequent consequentially see like an increase in like gallon bottles or like the big two liter bottles, but we still wanted those people to have uh, access to safe drinking water. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I just saw a um, a thing in Chicago. You know, they're they're dealing with water quality issues and lead pipes as well, and they've got a um, like a Chicago branded canned water that's mm -hmm. going to be free to I think everybody or at least people. I think everybody. Um, I didn't I didn't dig into the article. I just saw it this week, um, but it is something that's getting discussed a little more widely. Trey, I think I'll probably throw the next question over to you as our resident trash person. Um, we had someone earlier, and I missed this before, ask, um, has anyone given any thought as to why bottles end up in the river? Is it sewage, rain, runoff, or just consumers not caring where they toss their empty bottles? You want to take that one? Yeah, I'll start, and then I'd be happy to hear the team's impressions too. Um, so, you know, the bottles, we take people on the boat and they see the bottles and there's, you know, these are wraps of bottles, right? There's just many, many bottles. Sometimes the only trash you'll see is bottles. And sometimes it's hundreds of them just on a, a quick trip. And, and people have this idea that people throw them directly into the river. Uh, but most, by the time people actually find the Anacostia River and get to it, you know, they're not usually the ones dumping trash into the river. Um, there's not groups of people on bridges dropping bottles into the river. It's really happening everywhere on land and it gets dropped or dumped or it shuffles out of a truck or it shuffles out of a bin. However, it gets on the ground. Once it's on the ground, it, the next time the wind blows or the rain comes down, it's in the storm drain. And the next time we get a big rain, that storm drain gets flushed into the storm sewer and the storm sewer comes out usually unfiltered to the Anacostia River or a tributary. So it's actually all of those things. Um, but the root cause is people not putting it where it needs to be, right, in a recycling bin. There are some instances of them escaping recycling bins or recycling trucks and getting onto the ground that way, but that's a very small percentage. Most of what we see is, you know, after big festivals, we'll see them, you know, around construction areas where the guys were eating lunch. Uh, there's there's a whole lot of places where there are hot spots, like at bus stops uh, where the trash cans might be full or people just didn't take the time or have the time. But with, with consumer plastics, it's really coming from the consumer. And whether it's because they couldn't find a better trash can or whatever else, shifting the material to something that either adding value to that material by creating a, a fee or shifting the material from plastic to aluminum and glass with a ban uh, solves a lot of those problems that plastics cause uniquely in the environment, which we don't see from aluminum and glass. Or wax cardboard, you know, in the case of boxed water.
So this next question might be a little bit out of the scope of what you guys looked at, but were you, did you consider um, policies related to um, sort of developing, ch changing plastic bottle materials to decompose faster and be more environmentally friendly? I think that's what the question is trying to ask. Um, this would be a producer end bill, something to sort of force them to make a more environmentally friendly plastic bottle. I think that's probably outside of what we asked you for, but if you came across it in your research, uh, feel free to, to speak to that. Um, yeah, I think we did look at kind of a, uh, a briefly looked at a plastic bottle, like a, a material, like a recyclable material. Um, uh, Grace, I think you did some of the research on EP, uh, it would be like an EPR kind of uh, shoulder bill, but we kind of steered away from that. Um, uh, do you want to speak more to that? Yeah, so Nestle and Coca-Cola are currently paying over four times more for recycled or bio-based materials in their plastic bottles. Um, but we believe that this does not address the issue at hand. And so we think it's a misguided attempt at reducing pollution. Um, therefore, we didn't include any recycled content policies or plant-based alternative materials in our policy analysis. It's also a very, like, extender producer responsibility is also a very complicated issue, specifically within the United States and politically right now, it's people kind of go back and forth on what we should implement. So I think we, within our project was six months and within six months, I there was not really gonna be the option to create an extend producer responsibility um, policy for this analysis, because it was just too much. I would add that I, I think a lot of research out there suggests that a lot of the plant-based plastics don't aren't really that much better, or if they do break down, they need sort of still fairly special conditions in order to break down effectively. And so you're not going to see them breaking down in a in a standard landfill. They're really not that much better for, you know, our river perspective. And um it, it's not, again, addressing the, the root problem, as I think Grace just mentioned. Um, one question that I had when you were talking about the bottle bill, since that's sort of a lot of what we're discussing in the chat here, um, is how did you come up with 15 cents? Because I feel like I was a little startled by that number. It seemed it seemed like a high deposit, um, and I, I feel like you probably had a pretty good reason for that. Yeah, so high bottle deposits are pretty like very strongly correlated with high redemption rates. Now there are things to consider like how many materials the bottle bill covers. Like obviously it would cover more than just plastic bottles, like it would be aluminum glass, but how many different types of materials and the size of bottles included. So we, with our interviews, a lot of the states right now either have five or 10 cent deposits. And a lot of these states are trying to increase that they're either trying to go from by the 10 or they're trying to go from 10 to 15. So we were just going to get ahead of the times and start at 15. Cool. I definitely was expecting five to 10. So I'm glad that um, you guys are already out ahead of that one. Yeah. And to put it into perspective, uh, Christine, I mean, it, most most papers and the research that we looked at uh, said the deposit should be around 30 cents today. Oh just my. based off of inflation <laughs> and um, you know, cost of living. Um, and so, you know, starting out as 15 is kind of the base level. And then those, like we said, the automatic updates, um, to ensure that it keeps up and that reflect, uh, redemption levels don't fall, uh, right. is really important. Okay. This next question, um, or, or sort of a comment, uh, says that some countries, uh, including France use a public bottle refill system. And if you sort of created that that fund with the unredeemed money from like a bottle bill, would you be able to allocate that to opportunities to build out some sort of public refill system, um, especially in areas affected with poor water quality? Right now, it's not built into the policy. Um, 
I think it's honestly just something we didn't necessarily think of. Um, but, you know, like we said in um, the case study of the bottle tax, where tax revenue goes needs to be strictly defined. So that's definitely something that um, could be defined within where the tax revenue goes for the bottle bill or the bottle tax. All right. I will point out, I'll jump in again. This is Trey again. Um, DC Water has their Tap It program, which, you know, at a lot of their like big public events, they'll show up to festivals and everything with, with hard plastic, but reusable plastic bottles. And they have a refill station there with usually cold water, just, you know, extra awesome in the summer. And there is a network. I haven't checked into it lately, but there was like a network of restaurants that, were, were signed up as, with Tap It, where people could use their, their bottles to get water, you know, without being asked why they were there or anything else. And as, as someone who usually uses a reusable bottle and, and refills it on the fly quite a bit, I've never really been hassled um, for, for filling up like at a soda machine with water, as long as it's actually water. Um, never mind places that actually have water fountains. So there's, there's definitely a dearth of public drinking water infrastructure in DC, you know, you see them peeling back old water fountains and not replacing them in a lot of places. But uh, there is this this program, Tap It. I'm pretty sure there's similar programs in, in other places around the country. And it is uh, sort of a sideways way of getting around that and, and getting back into a, a semi-public access to, to drinking water. All right, so I think the last question I see here is one we started to touch on, but there was one piece of it we didn't quite discuss. And Susan had said that you um, you mentioned the bottle bill should be administered by the beverage industry. Um, and, you know, she talks about the concerns with EPR laws. And are you, I, I think I missed that when you guys were talking about the this for the bottle bill, but are you considering any sort of government oversight then if you're going to have the bottle bill administered by the beverage industry? Yeah, so we actually, we actually, when we started writing this policy, we actually wanted it to be government run, but I believe it, Tyler did our California case study and they said that having a government run bottle bill was just super inefficient. So we actually changed and we went back to producer run, but we, we did want to have a, like a, as much government oversight as possible. That's why the money, like the money from unredeemed deposits is strictly controlled. Like it doesn't go straight back to producers. It goes to the retailers and to the different funds. And then additionally, um, the government ha can like increase the deposit and, like has the standardized uh, the standardization of the redemption or the bottles redeemed like the percentage that's reported so that uh, like producers can't like fudge the numbers to show like oh yeah we have a super successful program and it's really not so so with our reporting requirements that we recommend for the bottle bill we would have producers send a report every year and then every five years a random audit would be done to ensure that what they're reporting is actually correct. And that would be most likely by a DC inspector or a third party inspector of some sort. Um, and that would be something for DC to clarify within their policy. All right, I think I've gotten all of the questions in the chat. If, I, if I've missed any more, feel free to throw them back in one more time. In the meantime, um, a couple of people asked if you guys, if your paper would be available online anywhere, maybe through the school or something like that. We don't have the abil ability to like make it public through the university, but if like Anacostia Riverkeepers wanted to make it available, we could make it available through that. Okay, then um, we can plan to pull together a blog post or something like that and we'll link to your paper uh, once we've done that and uh, share it out with everybody who came here, as well as the recording from today in case somebody missed it. And seeing no more questions in the chat, I wanna thank everybody for coming. I wanna thank you guys for all the work that you did. This was a really great presentation. I'm really looking forward to diving into the paper and hopefully uh, we can use this to launch some sort of um, some campaign coming up in the future. So um, thank you guys, everybody, and um, have a good evening.